Hi guys, just uh, uh, doing a quick recording today for you guys on um, uh, sort of the basic, the basics information that you'll need if you come in to do a thoracic case in a vascular reward. Uh, this is definitely just a 10 minute taster. This is a very complicated subject, um, but this should uh, get you going um, and uh, give you some information on which to start your day. So firstly, Practically, what kind of cases do we do at the PLC? Uh, so for the biggest cases we do are the open extent force. So these would be this kind of thoracic aneurysm. Anything bigger than that will go to uh, foothills, and you'll see that in the cardiac rotation. Um, so these patients, they do go into the chest, um, uh, and it's a pretty big open case. And we'll talk about some of the considerations for that later. Then when we come to our uh, endovascular approaches, we can do hybrid approaches where we do um, open a deep branching of the aorta. So they go in, uh, take all the branches off, re-implant them, and then just stent down the aorta. So this is to kind of protect organs and spinal cord. We don't do that very often, but it does happen. And people that don't think will tolerate clamping. Uh, the next option, um, that's a little less invasive is the fenestrated stents uh, where they have custom-made stents uh, so they stent the aorta and then as well have branched stents that go around the branch grafts and then the plain old straight um, stents would be the, the shortest quickest and least invasive uh, procedure that we do so you could see any of those when you come into our OR uh, so then uh, this is kind of what the setup look when we say hybrid OR, that's because it's a hybrid between operating room and uh, radiology suite. And so here are, uh, just a reminder, here is our aorta. So with the, with the branch vessels, uh, if we start proximal from the heart, um, so we start with our aortic root. And then we have our brachycephalic artery going to right subclavian and right common carotid. Uh, we have our left common carotid and our left subclavian. So this is kind of a classic arch morphology. They don't all look like that. Um, and you will all learn how that impacts our work when you come into our service. Next up are the intercostal arteries, followed by the celiac artery, um, the celiac gastric splenic hepatic artery which is like the celiac access uh, then the renal arteries and then the superior mesenteric and inferior mesenteric arteries finally uh, branching out to the iliacs and then down to the legs so uh, when we put clamps on um, the the least invasive clamp we can do is an infrarenal clamp so uh, clamp goes on just below the renal arteries. Um, still affects renal arterial blood flow, but uh, uh, not not as significantly as the higher clamps. Next up would be a suprarenal clamp, or juxtarenal as it's sometimes described, which significantly impacts renal function. Higher clamp um, and more reperfusion abnormalities and hemodynamic implications for clamping. And then we get to what's really, really big ticket item, which is our supercilia clamp, where all of our spline clinical vessels are excluded from the circulation, as well as our intercostal arteries during the time of clamping. Um, and uh, so these will all get re-implanted in a graft, uh, uh, but the intercostals do not, which is what impacts our spinal cord perfusion. So just to kind of give you guys a little bit of a reminder of where all those different clamps are. Now, what are the things that we really have to think about? We're going to just, as I said, do some, some, some sort of tasters as to the things that get impacted in thoracic aortic surgery. So first on is our blood pressure. So um, blood pressure gets significantly impacted in our open cases uh, with clamping. And we've said that really depends on kind of how, how high the clamp goes, how significant the impact of clamping and reperfusion is. Um, during endovascular surgery, though, we still need very good blood pressure control because we need a low blood pressure for stent deployment and then immediately afterwards a higher blood pressure um, to maintain spinal cord perfusion once the aneurysm or the dissection has been fixed. Um, and there, there are some techniques 
that we will use and that you will see during the um, during the procedures for significantly dropping cardiac output uh, during surgery. And at our side, that would be either adenosine arrest or occlusion of left atrial inflow. So for monitoring, we almost always will use invasive blood pressure. We prefer on the right, because uh, if they do work on the left subclavian or carotids, um, uh, then our right side uh, pressure will not be as affected as the left side. So preferred or exclusively on the right, depending on where the surgeons will, will get their access. Um, do we, we want to use central venous um, access uh, for uh, inotrope uh, supplementation. Um, this uh, can be an issue when we do carotid carotid bypass, but these cases are in a small minority. But other um, options have to be exercised if this is part of your procedure. Um, we will have a very variety of medications ready to uh, treat low and high blood pressures. Uh, norepinephrine would be a very standard drug, and then for the opens, maybe nitroglycerin or nitroglycerin or nitroprusside, plus my, plus minus vasopressin or inhaled norepinephrine for reperfusion on the uh, big open cases. Um, almost all of them will have cerebral oximetry because we're working very close to the arch and uh, um, either dissection of carotids or a monitoring of cerebral flow and. Um, a generalized cardiac output is important. And then TEE is also a very common monitor that we use in these cases for the endo cases to guide um, deployment and for the open cases to look at uh, the impact of reperfusion on either right ventricular, left ventricular function, um, filling as well as systemic vascular resistance. So blood pressure, big deal. So blood loss. Uh, for our, this, this is really more of an issue for our open cases. On our endo cases, uh, blood loss is uh, really not that significant. So for our open cases, uh, we would have two large bar IVs, um, likely a MAC or, or a um, cordis in the neck. Uh, we would have a blood warmer, um, and for the open repairs, rapid infusers and cell savers, um, we would get blood up to the OR. All of these patients would have a catheter and we would be preparing to manage massive transfusion and likely fibrinolysis in our open cases. Uh, for ventilation, uh, do, what would we need to think about? Uh, well, for EVERS, um, we need to be able to guarantee apnea while they're doing their imaging. The ventilation will blur the image, um, so whatever anesthetic technique you employ, uh, you have to be sure that you can have apnea on request. Uh, for our open thoracic aortic surgeries, we um, often have to provide one lung ventilation with the left lung down. This is suitable for double lumen tube as well as for bronchial blockers, which is my personal choice. And then consider the use of evac tubes in urgent cases or in patients where um, ICU admission is a strong possibility. Coagulation is our next big category. All of these patients will be heparinized. Some of them will be reversed. This is definitely based on a surgical request. For longer cases, we will run heparin infusions and we will monitor with the ACT, similar to cardiac. The number that we need in vascular is 200, so not as much as in cardiac. Um, for our open cases, we will be preparing for massive transfusion. Uh, calcium will be a uh, big part of that, so we will often run infusions of that or just have it to hand. Um, be prepared for not just your usual coagulopathy for with blood transfusion, but with for active fibrinolysis for, with supercilia clamps. Um, TXA is a bit of a quandary. It would be a great drug to, uh, great drug to stop the fibrinolysis, but uh, it is renally excreted. And so if you're going to put a clamp above the kidneys, you cannot be running infusions through the case. So our compromise usually is to give a 15 per kilo kind of half an hour or so before the clamp goes on uh, and then nothing more until we're sure that the kidneys are working and get a sense of whether there is still ongoing fibrinolysis before we repeat the dosing towards the end of the case. Um, getting the rheostop or the fibrinogen concentrate up to the OR in advance of bigger cases and checking your fibrinogen at the start to know um, what your baseline is, is, is also good practice. Uh, we use albumin in these cases as part of our volume resuscitation protocol. So 5% of um, uh, the 500 ml bottles uh, can also be ordered in advance. 
Now the next big ticket thing to think of is an, a second organ ischemia. So we're putting these clamps on and including vascular supply to many different organs, all of which will impact our patient. And we have to be prepared for those impacts um, on our anesthetic as well as try and prevent um, damage from occurring if we can. So these are the arteries that we've said we, were go we are going to compromise. So we are going to um, potentially uh, occlude the uh, renal arteries with suprarenal clamps, um, the SMA uh, to the bowel, the celiac axis that will go to the liver with the impact of that, the intercostal arteries uh, to the spinal cord, uh, the subclavian that has branch vessels to spinal cord as well as to your vertebral system. Uh, and if you do not have an intact circle of Willis, can lead to, to stroke. Um, most of the stroke that you get with thoracic uh, aortic work is embolic, but you can definitely get ischemic stroke in some patients. We've seen that. If you're going to occlude the one of the carotid arteries, that does require a, by a bypass. So carotid to carotid bypass. We sometimes do carotid subclavian bypass, that's a separate topic, when and uh, how that's indicated. Um, but that could be part of your procedure, the carotid subclavian bypass. The spinal cord protection is also a separate topic, spinal drains is some of what we do. And what happens when you make the liver ischemic um, is, a, is a big topic um, to think about. Um, so we're not going to go into this as much, but just to kind of keep that in your mind, that all of these things are happening. You're making them ischemic, you're reperfusing them, and uh, strategies need to be in place. Temperature management is our next um, big topic. So our goal um, for most of these cases would be a little bit of controlled mild hypothermia that helps with the spinal cord protection. So we allow some drift. Um, we do not want to allow warm ischemia to the lower lips during clamping. So please make sure you turn your um, underbody warmers or lower body warmers off if you've clamped the aorta. Um, expect a drop in temperature with reperfusion of the ischemic looms as well as with cold renal perfusion. So when you hear a surgeon ask for cold renal perfusion, what they do is hook up some really ice cold ringers lactate into their renal artery. Um, that perfuses the kidney and then returns to the systemic circulation via the renal vein. So whatever goes into that patient goes into the system. So at the time of clamping, uh, you will get very cold ringers lactate um, entering the systemic circulation in addition to the splanchnic circulation volume that's returned uh, that, that enters the circulation with a, with a high clamp. So uh, be prepared for that. Um, to, how do we manage this? We have underbody warmers for our endovascular cases because both arms are tucked and the upper bodies don't work that well. For opens, uh, we will warm the room before the patient come in, try and manage the temperature before clamping uh, so that we don't get severe hypothermia. Um, so clearly we will have temperature probes, fluid, temperature probes, fluid warmers, and rapid infusers. And, uh, those are our considerations uh, for our thoracic cases. Um, keep them in mind and uh, have fun doing those cases, guys. Uh, thanks, for thanks for listening. It's nice to uh, see you in the OR.